Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome you all to the next lecture on inorganic chemistry of life, principles and perspectives. In the previous couple of classes, I have tried to introduce the enzymes based on vanadium and based on manganese. In case of vanadium, we have seen vanadium bromoperoxidase, chloroperoxidase, haloperoxidase and also we have looked at the inhibition of the vanadate in the ATPase cycle. And on the other hand, in case of uh, manganese uh, case, we have looked at uh, manganese superoxide dismutase which is one manganese based one. Then we also looked at the manganese catalase where there are two manganese ions are there. Then we have looked at the oxygen evolving system of the photosystem 2 which is tetranuclear manganese cluster. So, we have looked at all these three. So, for these cases we have looked at all the uh, mechanistic aspects and more details and the rest of the items were just covered to as a information into that. Now, let us smoothly get into the next topic that is on the iron uh, in the biological inorganic chemistry. Uh, so, here we may be taking a bit longer time because the iron case is uh, quite huge. There are a huge number of enzymes are present in the biological systems. Uh, both based in the heme and non heme. So, therefore, we will be spending, uh, spending a bit several more lectures on the iron biological inorganic chemistry. Okay, let us look at this particular slide as you can see the iron is very special because there is something called heme which I have already introduced in the introductory courses or uh, classes and then uh, we have a non heme too. And look at the heme proteins they can do oxygen transport, they can do electron transport, they can do oxygenation, they can do reduction, many kinds of things, variety of oxidations, reductions, everything. Look at non heme where there is no heme, they can do transport, they can do electron transfer, they can do oxygenase, okay. they can do uh, deoxygenase, they can do reductase, they can do hydrogenase, variety, variety, variety of uh, functions are there. Okay. So, iron case we also have the ferritin which is iron storage protein and uh, a transferrin which is iron transport protein. Okay. So, I think we will uh, try to start with uh, transport systems first then we will go to the other cases. Okay. Oxid transport proteins. So, oxid transport proteins which we are very well aware in human systems is hemoglobin which we are not so commonly aware is other things like hemerythrin and hemocyanin not for human systems, but these are for other kinds of things I will show you in the next slide. So, the short form for hemoglobin is used as HB, a short form for hemerythrin is called HR, a short form for hemocyanin is uh, referred as HC. Let us look at uh, this particular table which tells you the uh, various properties, various uh, aspects of these transport proteins. As you know hemoglobin is for the human, higher animals, hemerythrin is invertebrates and hemocyanin is arthropods and molluscus. So, as you can see the, the hierarchy of the life uh, changing from the higher life to somewhat intermediate, somewhat to, uh, lower kind of thing. So, these uh, let us look at a few of the properties. The, uh, there is an iron, iron is the form of heme in the hemoglobin. In the hemerythrin, there is no heme, okay. And there is uh, one iron, one oxygen in hemoglobin, two iron with one oxygen in hemerythrin, two coppers and one oxygen in hemocyanin. So, coppers, not irons. So, metal and uh, oxy. Uh, in oxy protein means oxygenated one. In case of hemoglobin it is iron 2 plus, in case of uh, hemerythrin it is iron 3 plus, in case of hemocyanin it is copper 2 plus. Deoxy form that means when there is no oxygen bound then there is again Fe2 plus in the hemoglobin uh, and Fe2 plus in case of hemerythrin and copper plus in hemocyanin. You can see that there is a one electron difference in this. One should think of where does this one electron go? 
So, this electrode must go into the oxygen, the O2 that is bound, whereas here there is no change in the number of electrons in the oxidation state, therefore O2 does not accept any electrons. Or straight away one can, one can derive such information from here. Okay. So, because ion 2, ion 2, here is ion 3, ion 2, obviously one electrode difference, copper 2, copper 1. And you know that there are two ions, so two cases, 2 into 1 electron here. There are two coppers, 2 into 1 electron here. So, that means O2 is not O2 in these things, possibly O2 with some two electrons or something of that kind. We will come to all those details a bit while, just hold on your breath to understand more details. Now, come to the form of uh, the uh, color aspects of it, oxy form, uh, in case of blood, we know very well blood is red and hemerythrin case uh, uh, burgundy and in case of uh, hemocyanin blue. So, these are called the blue blood animals. Uh, the arthropods and molluscus are referred as the blue blood animals, we are red bed blood animals. Uh, color of deoxy form, red purple uh, in case of uh, hemoglobin and almost colorless in case of uh, hemerythrin and almost colorless in case of uh, uh, hemocyanin. The reason is this is in copper 1 and this here is copper 2, but due to some other reason the color is lost here and the color is still there. Okay. So, let us look at what kind of a binding course that these have. We mentioned one iron, one oxygen. In case of hemoglobin, you see that this whole thing is uh, heme and this is the iron center which is uh, uh, connected through the uh, four nitrogens of the porphyrin and there is one more nitrogen coming from uh, histidine which is called proximal histidine which is coming from the uh, protein chain, side chain of the protein of the, of the hemoglobin. So, globin chain and on this side you have a sixth coordination where the oxygen is bonded. Now, in case of uh, hemerythrin the oxo form, the oxo form is bonded to the o, O2 is not like, uh, like O2 like this here. Uh, it is already. So, what is this? This is like peroxo or hydroperoxo and you know that the peroxo and hydroperoxo are formed from O2 after two electrons reduction and that is what I showed you on the previous slide just by looking at the iron oxidation state in the oxyform versus the deoxyform, very easy. And of course, the two ions uh, are uh, bonded by three histidines, two histidines respectively and these are uh, bridged by the carboxylates, etc. We will come to more details later on. Okay, uh, and the in case of uh, hemocyanin, the two coppers again O2, this O2 is O2 to minus, so there are again two electrons, copper 1, copper 1 becomes copper 2, copper 2, therefore two electrons that will become this one. So, the way the oxygen is present in human blood is more or less unpetrumed O2 or least petrumed O2. And whereas, in case of these uh, hemerythrin and hemocyanin, the one of the bond is almost uh, reduced from the double bond of the O2. So, which means when it uh, releases, it should gain back that. So, therefore, there is a quite a huge mechanism involved in these, uh, uh, these delivery of the oxygen, which uh, are not very well understood. So, we will not go into more details, but we will compare only the features, but we will go into more details of this. Uh, uh, of the hemoglobin. Okay, look at this particular structure shown over here on the right side, ribbons, you know, alpha helical structures, etc. Not ribbons, this uh, kind of a helical structures, and there are some random coils, very little of the beta sheet will be there. And in the center, there is a core here, there is a core, protein formed a core. In this core, you have the uh, heme that is the porphyrin and center metal, iron and this histidine. Histidine is coming from this particular helix. This particular thing is myoglobin, it has only one unit and its molecular weight is 12.4 kilo Dalton. Now, on the other hand, if you connect four such units, I will show in the next slide how they are connected, the four such uh, units, then it becomes hemoglobin. So, myoglobin is one unit, hemoglobin is four such units. So, 4 into 12.4, 49.6, around 50 kilo Dalton is the molecular weight. So, so, but what happens when the four of these are connected, the resultant protein which is called a hemoglobin and it is not a myoglobin. 
and there are changes in its properties too as we will see in the next one. So, let us see that uh, how uh, hemoglobin looks like. Now, hemoglobin looks like you can see first one heme here that yellow portion, one more heme here, one more heme here, one more heme here. That means the pro four such units one on this side, one on the back side, one on the front, one on the rear. So, totally four very symmetrically connected it is called quaternary structure and four myoglobins are joined together to form a hemoglobin. But the myoglobin now let me tell you myoglobin means uh, myo is muscle. So, it is present in the muscle and it is involved the myoglobin is involved in mostly in the storage of the oxygen whereas, the hemoglobin heme uh, hemoglobin hemo referring to the blood. So, hemoglobin is involved in transport. So, when we have one protein unit it acts like a storage when you have four such units are joined together it acts like a transport protein. This looks like a very interesting is not it. How come uh, uh, one unit of the protein is just a storage and four such units join together there is something called cooperativity. That means, these four units which are joined together do not behave as an independent or individual units rather they jointly work as a cooperative unit. So, it is this cooperativity which brings in the transport property for hemoglobin and storage property for the myoglobin. So, the storage versus transport we are going to discuss and debate in the next several slides. Why is that one is the transport uh, storage alone other is the transport. Okay. So, whatever I said till now let me let uh, I have uh, uh, summarized in the form of structures on this particular slide. This whole thing is your myoglobin and this is your heme portion. Okay. So, you can see the myoglobin and this is the hemoglobin one such unit, one such unit, one more and one more four units are there. And if you expand any one of this unit and you can see this. So, this one and this one looks exactly alike, exactly alike no difference at all almost, but each of these is interconnected. So, so therefore, you have uh, this is what we were trying to say that one unit is not good for transport is good for storage when you connect the four of these units then it is uh, the uh, protein has a uh, transport phenomena and it shifts from the storage to the transport uh, kind of a system. Now, first of all look at some features if some protein has to be a nice uh, you know transport protein of our oxygen what kind of qualities should it have. What kind of quality should it have? Number 1, it should bind the protein must bind to O2 number 1 and number 2 is the O2 should not get perturbed at all. That means, O2 should not uh, lose its bonding double bond character or O2 should not receive electrons to itself okay. and there are some additional things are also there. Okay. So, let us look at this one. So, you need to have oxygen binding to the ion center that is one of the quality and then the protein should stabilize this complex in this form not in the not in the reduced form. And then the binding pocket of the O2 in the protein it should not allow the oxygen to get either one electron reduced, two electron reduced or whatever it is there. It should not happen that means O2 should not get activated or O2 should not get reduced by electrons either of these terms are one and the same. Okay. They are all one and the same and one more thing which we do not know generally, but when you think of the chemistry then we will certainly know. Iron 2 ions you know very well you take a iron 2 salt let us say ferric ferrous chloride and dissolve in water and just go out for a cup of tea and come back what you will see you will see quite dark brownish color sometimes even a precipitate if your tea time is too long you might even do uh, see a precipitate too or your water is bit of a bit of a uh, alkaline also you can see that. So, there is an oxidation there could be hydrolysis all these kinds are possible. Similarly, when an iron 2 in uh, 
hemoglobin or heme binds to oxygen why should it not get oxidized yes it should it would get oxidized so therefore iron 2 p refers to porphyrin if you add o2 temporarily obviously it will make iron 3 with a uh, kind of a peroxo because two electrons will go and uh, over a period of time it will lose uh, one of the oxygens etc. Uh, there is a mechanism not shown over here and that will form iron oxo iron 3 iron 3 oxo iron 3 this is called muoxo dimer. Once this is formed there is no reversible. So, that means your oxygen is fully activated O2 to uh, peroxokine to the uh, mu oxo. So, that means O2 is completely destroyed. So, such kind of thing should not happen. So, that means your hemoglobin should or even myoglobin for that matter to store O2 in its real form you require to uh, maintain the bond order and should not. Uh, so, therefore, the protein should make a complex with O2, O2 should not reduce the thing and uh, iron 2 plus should be protected so that there is no mu oxo dimer is formed. One more difference is required for the protein because the substrate for this protein is O2 not the CO and so therefore, there should be recognition of CO versus O2 by the protein. So, CO is a diatomic molecule O2 is again diatomic molecule and how does the protein know whether it is a CO or O2 is the only difference is only very small difference how does that so, if does not recognize then always the carbon monoxide will bind and that will passivate your protein. So, therefore, this is an important event we will come back to that how does the protein how does the protein whether it is a myoglobin or hemoglobin differentiate CO versus O2 that we are going to look at in a while. Now, for a while let us focus on two aspects one is no oxygen bound case other is oxygen bound case. So, it is called oxy form it is called deoxy form the left side is the deoxy form right side is the oxy form and take this thick line as the perpendicular view of the porphyrin. Okay. So, that means this is a porphyrin plane is like in line the iron is bit above that. So, it is showing around 0.6 angstrom above the cavity of the heme. Now, if you put the oxygen this is still above, but not as much it is about 0.2 angstrom. So, almost about 0.4 angstrom drop has happened from the iron from its plane. So, the iron is here plane is here. So, and then it comes closer. So, when you have oxygen is bound then the iron comes closer when oxygen is not bound is farther away. So, let us look at in the deoxy form of course, in both the cases I 2 is a D 6 system and you can see that you have a high spin system. And on the other hand once you make the uh, oxygen ligand uh, then you form uh, the low spin complex. And because of that uh, this is iron is able to come and uh, sit in this that I will explain in the next slide why in the oxy form iron is more fit into the more fit into the cavity of the heme and whereas it is not so much fit in the just wait for a while on the next slide I will be explaining that or oh, if you think in the meanwhile it is already good. Okay. Clue for this is I tell you I, I give a clue this is a high spin iron center this is a low spin iron center both iron 2 that is the clue. Now, you can understand why it is going into the thing. So, I will explain just uh, unravel that in a while, but you can you are always welcome to uh, think of on that lines as well hemoglobin without the bound oxygen the oxyhemoglobin uh, is bound with the bound oxygen and it has a lower absorption 660 nanometer deoxy has a 940 uh, nanometer and this is the difference that is used for measurement of the amount of oxygen in present in the patient's blood by using the pulse oximeter in most of the hospitals and uh, uh, labs uh, uh, where you go for uh, pathological labs where they check your uh, your blood samples for oxygen purpose they will do that. Now, you understand that the uh, D6 configuration is in uh, uh, high spin in case of uh, deoxy and low spin in case of uh, oxy and I told you to think why the iron is coming closer to the plane in case of oxy and not so in that. 
Now, you see the high spin ion, you know that how do you define a size of an ion. So, the, uh, we define the size of the ion or even an atom to the extent from nucleus to the extent to which the electron density is spread. So, therefore, it is the spread of the electron density that you need to uh, look at that. So, in case of high spin, the electrons are filled not only in the ground in the uh, other uh, excited level, higher energy levels too. So, therefore, the size of the, uh, of the, the ion is bit growing or longer. So, therefore, it is roughly about 0.8 angstroms in case of deoxy. Now, the moment you put the oxygen and then oxygen uh, once you put the ion 2 goes into the uh, low spin uh, and once it goes to the low spin all the 6 electrons are paired into the ground state uh, you know T 2 G it is a 6 coordinated system octahedral system. So, T 2 G 6 therefore, the electron density is, is, is somewhat compressed therefore, the size is basically compressed. So, almost from 0.8 to 0.6 is the kind of a change which is about 25 to 30 percent uh, change in this. So, you know that uh, from the coordination chemistry principles that what we studied is that we know that the oxoligands are not very strong field ligands, they are rather weak field ligands and they generally encourage the system uh, in the case of uh, uh, as a high spin complexes. But in case of hemoglobin, or the myoglobin when the oxygen is bound as an additional ligand, uh, but it uh, prefers the low spin. So, it is not because of the ligand field strength when this is bound there are some conformational changes come and these conformational changes indeed favor the uh, low spin configuration of the electrons in the D system rather than the high spin. It is that part. It is not the oxygen has become suddenly a, a strong field ligand. No, it is not true. That. So, therefore, therefore, what we know the coordination chemistry is correct, but there are several things which we do not know because in the protein chemistry, the protein conformation, protein structures are also important along with the inorganic chemistry aspects of it. So, together, so here I hope you understand why uh, what happens uh, uh, when the oxygen is bound to the ion uh, size and why and how does it get uh, fitted into this. Uh, I hope you understood all that. Okay. So, therefore, in the deoxyhemoglobin it is too large and in the oxyhemoglobin it is uh, smaller and goes closer to that. So, uh, and we already have seen in the earlier the protein that is surrounding this heme does not allow the oxidation of the ion 2 plus to ion 3 plus. It does not allow ion oxo iron which is called mu oxo dimer formation all of these are prevented and it also does not allow the electrons to flow into the O2 because of the kind of redox potential that we have for the ion center in the hemoglobin and myoglobin systems. Okay, uh, one another aspect that I talked to you is that uh, this enzyme must recognize O2 and uh, uh, over that of the CO. It is very, very important. Okay, so, for this why should it? Because if you look at the cells and if you see the cells are always having uh, CO uh, being generated from the dead cells etc. about which is about 1 percent of the CO is always present in cells all the time. So, that means O2 must bind to the uh, hemoglobin in presence of the 1 percent of the uh, of the CO. That means the enzyme must differentiate the CO versus O2 at that particular uh, particular concentration of CO even. If not what will happen? CO will bind. If CO binds, CO binds much better, stronger by about 30 to 50 fold stronger and irreversible, stronger and irreversible. And we know the reasons uh, of this uh, back bonding between the metal and the ligand all those kinds of things come into picture which you must have studied in very uh, simple uh, the inorganic uh, bonding uh, studies uh, or coordination chemistry bonding studies as well. Uh, as compared to the O2. Uh, so, therefore, that is one thing. Now, we will come to that point just in a while, but let us see now. So, when it binds uh, to O2, uh, you see that this is known from the structures 
of the small molecule as well even from the protein that the FeOO is a bent structure is around 120 degrees or so. And such a kind of structure is stabilized by uh, two things. There is a, a kind of a push from this side and there is a kind of attraction from this side histidine which is called the distal histidine where there is a hydrogen bond it stabilizes. On the other hand when the CO binds, CO binds like a linear FeCO and this is 180 degrees and this has no stabilizing uh, power into this. So, therefore, the binding nature of these is different. You see that this is the deoxy uh, of course, in the resting state there will be water, water will be replaced by O2 and then when O2 comes here this is what binds, this is the stabilizing force. Now, if you look at uh, I am sure you must have heard several cases where there is an accident, a fire, uh, people uh, obviously die. You know the main reason for the people die not because of the uh, they are burned, but because they are being choked with the, uh, with the smoke. So, that is more dangerous than even the fire because people will run away and they can save themselves. But whereas, when the smoke is spread, even if you run, then smoke uh, haunts you and then the smoke, uh, you, you breathe the smoke and the smoke has got CO, uh, most of it and the CO concentration in your lungs becomes so huge, then your uh, my, uh, hemoglobin will get saturated with the CO. And once it is saturated with the CO, no reversible and you die. And that is most mainly the reason why uh, most of the uh, deaths are because of the CO a smoke uh, reason not because of even the burns. Of course, I am not saying there are no deaths or the burns I'm, what I am saying is the maximum things always because when the fire is there obviously firefighters will come and try to extinguish the fire, but the smoke is not easily extinguished so easily as the fire. Fire gets in, is extinguished immediately the smoke uh, goes longer. So, therefore, people before they can escape out of the danger, probably they get caught into the danger of this one. So, so that the higher at that stage can this protein differentiate between O2 and CO? No, because there is a concentration shift, huge concentration of CO, even that uh, uh, this stability whatever you have is overcome by that. But within the cell, yes, where there is one cell, uh, percent of CO is there, it is always there. Okay, now, let us try to look at, uh, so we have looked at the various properties that such a proteins uh, should uh, make, uh, should exhibit. Now, look at one particular aspect of this, suppose uh, if a transport protein binds to oxygen very strongly, what level of strength of uh, oxygen binding is important? Those proteins which are strong in binding will have a problem in releasing okay? and you see that when they are strong in binding they will go something like this which is called the hyperbolic kind of a uh, thing. Now, if take some transport protein where is some transport protein which is uh, uh, strong not strong in binding, but uh, inefficient in binding and uh, somewhat efficient in the uh, the uploading kind of thing, then you would find the hyperbolic curve of this kind. Okay? So, there is a lot of difference. Now, here if you take a transport protein is both efficient in binding as well as transporting, both binding and transporting, then it will not be neither the hyperbolic of this type nor of this type, but of this type. What is this type called? This is called sigmoidal, sigmoidal one. So, what is the uh, myoglobin? The red one is myoglobin here, red one is myoglobin, red one is myoglobin. So, myoglobin is always going in the hyperbolic. Therefore, myoglobin is not meant for the transport, but it is just meant for the storage uh, of this. Okay? And let us try to see the same thing in case of the hemoglobin. Now, look at the myoglobin once again here. And this is what? This is the partial pressure O2 versus the uh, to what extent the uh, oxygen is oxygenated, protein is oxygenated. So, oxygen saturation, see Mb is the myoglobin is going like this, absolute hyperbolic. And forget about this Hb, look at this Hb, 
and here and you see a sigmoidal. So, look at on the right side this is a sigmoidal plot. So, in the sigmoidal plot what you have? You have a weak binding in this region and you have a strong binding in this region. That means, the protein has one kind of a conformational structure here and the protein has a different conformational structure. That means, protein is going from weak binding one conformational structure to strong binding to another conformational structure and there is a transition. So, that means, if a protein has the qualities to have a weak as well as a, to have a quality of the strong, then it will be able to function both pick up as well as the transport uh, the oxygen very efficiently. So, it can switch from the weak binding to the strong binding and I will continue with this in the next class. So, I am trying to explain you the oxygen storage uh, and release of this difference between the myoglobin and hemoglobin. So, in the next class I will continue and try to uh, cl clarify all the things associated with the mechanistic aspects of the oxygen transport in hemoglobin and which is not so in the myoglobin part of it. Thank you very much.